In film, there are a lot of ways to get information across to the viewer, but the most effective method is often through the use of movement, pushing in on someone delivering important information or pulling away to show just how isolated they've become. I have a particular interest in the use of moving objects to reveal information, like how Spielberg famously uses the glass of water in Jurassic Park to show the T-Rex is approaching, or the scene in Titanic where the character lets the bullet roll down the tilted desk to remind us we're on a slowly sinking ship. But often it's the movement of characters themselves that can provide the best insight into who they are and how they're evolving throughout the story, and that's never more front and center than in animation, where every centimeter of movement is choreographed and purposeful. I was recently reminded of this while watching Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, which it now seems fair to say is film's most recent entry into the pantheon of animated masterpieces. I mean, this film is gorgeous. The model work and set design are intricate and refreshingly organic. Its consistent use of light and color to convey mood is outstanding, but what stuck out to me most was how perfectly tailored the animation is for each of its main characters. There is a dark, poignant story to be told here, and just as any master filmmaker like del Toro knows, that story is best told through character. For instance, let's examine the two father figures of the film, Geppetto, voiced by David Bradley, and Count Volpe, voiced by Christoph Waltz. Geppetto is a modest woodcarver grieving the loss of his son, and like most parents who've lost a child, he got drunk one night, carved a new one out of wood, and is now dealing with the fallout after a wood sprite snuck into his home and gave life to it. Meanwhile, Count Volpe is a former aristocrat turned ringleader of a traveling circus, which he rules over with an iron fist. He views Pinocchio not as a real boy, but as a living puppet he aims to use as his ticket back to the aristocratic life. In line with his character, Volpe's movement is dynamic and flamboyant, swinging his arms in wide arcs, begging for the attention of anyone around. He's also a deeply dishonest man whose exaggerated movements reflect an awareness of his deceit. Now compare that with the slow, simple movements of Geppetto, someone seemingly at peace with his modest standing in life and with very little to hide. I especially love the way his fingers dance so delicately on the head of his hammer in this scene while he nervously discusses his late son with his new one. It's tiny details like this that really stand out on a rewatch and fill this movie with so much life. I want to focus particularly on one scene near the midpoint though, and I suppose if you're worried about spoilers in a movie like this, now is the time to check out. The scene I'm talking about takes place in the forest on their way home, just after Pinocchio is killed and resurrected for the first time. Volpe is planning a huge lawsuit against Geppetto for breaking a contract Pinocchio signed, and Podesta, the local fascist official, has conscripted Pinocchio into the military, seeing his immortality as the making for an ideal soldier. And as they walk through the forest, these things hang over Geppetto, while he processes the trauma of seeing another son die right in front of him. The forest is sparse and lifeless, a cold gray-blue sky hangs overhead. Notice how he trudges through the forest with a slow, rhythmic gait headed in a single direction? It's clear that in this moment, he's barely hanging on. Now compare that with the chaotic cadence of Pinocchio, who's still as curious and excited about life as he's been throughout the whole film. The two are completely disconnected here. Watch how, when Geppetto finally turns around for the first time, Pinocchio is already out of view, off to the side, forging his own path. And I love how Pinocchio impulsively picks up the stick here at the beginning of the scene, and then how naturally it turns into a weapon in his fantasy of war. Geppetto, though, understands the reality of war all too well. He literally reaches out and snatches this fantasy away from Pinocchio before breaking it into two. But Pinocchio doesn't understand. He defiantly crosses his arms and says he simply won't go to war. But Geppetto knows he can't stop any of this from happening. The lawsuit, the war, or the inevitable loss of a second son. Watch how he crosses the frame here as he becomes more aggravated, first to the left, and then back to the right. And look at Pinocchio the whole time, stuck relatively motionless in the center, simply observing his partner's movement. This is an obvious role reversal from the first half of the film, and it demonstrates the fundamental change to the relationship that's happening. And watch how the end of the scene plays out. Geppetto and Pinocchio spar over why he can't be more like Carlo before Geppetto finally loses all patience and utters the most devastating line of the entire film. You are such a burden. He walks away, leaving Pinocchio alone in the frame. And for the first time in the film, Pinocchio is left speechless. It's in this moment we know that the course of the film has been significantly changed by Geppetto's words. If you couldn't tell, I was just blown away by this movie, and I'm someone who admittedly does tend to skip a lot of animated films. It's a huge shame too that this is the third Pinocchio movie this year because I think that's gonna cause a lot of people to skip this movie who, like me, would have been profoundly surprised with how much they loved it. Thanks so much for sticking around. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, then, you know, do all the usual YouTube stuff and hopefully you'll like the next one too. I'm Tyler and this was episode one of Film Session.